Team, welcome back to another episode on Live Before Competes. I am joined today with Alethea Boone, who's over in Australia, joining me on a Zoom call. Zoom call. Alethea, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, look, Alethea, you're one of the first names I had down to be on the podcast. Uh, very fortunate to spend a bit of time with you whilst you were traveling the world back from Shanghai from a sanctioned event last year with yourself and Lima and bumped into you a few times since then at the CrossFit Games. Um, so thank you very much for being on the show. Uh, one of the reasons why I thought you had to be a guest was because I just, I'm a big fan of your story. Uh, there's been, it's not been an easy ride by any means. There's been a few hiccups on the way and it's certainly uh, a, a journey or a story that looks quite different to like your everyday CrossFit athlete these days. Um, I don't want to dig too much into your introduction because I know you're going to nail it much better than I am. So, Letha, <laughs> perhaps I'll hand over to you now. Please tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. So, a bit about me. I'm known through the CrossFit world just from making the CrossFit Games a few times. Um, I have a strong background in artistic gymnastics, and that took me all the way from primary school age through to collegiate gymnastics and representing New Zealand on the world stage. After that, I retired and I was a little bit lost and hence the introduction of CrossFit. Um, I, my whole, the reason why I started CrossFit was actually to just get fit. I had Googled a way, different way to get fit. CrossFit came up and next thing I knew, I emailed the closest CrossFit gym and that started it all off. I had no intention to compete whatsoever, but um, lo and behold, we made a few CrossFit Games appearances and managed to pick up another sport along the way in weightlifting. But that's pretty much my journey in terms of sporting history. Okay, well, it's not just a few CrossFit Games attendances here, Lethia. You attended the CrossFit Games 2014 on a team of CrossFit Active. You went yep. 2015, 2016, 2017 as an individual. And you went last year as a Masters athlete, your very first year as a Masters. So, yeah, small, small little feature at the CrossFit Games. A few, a few. <laughs> I'm interested. I always love hearing about people's first... Um, first uh i guess meeting with crossfit you know you move from being a gymnast uh and you're obviously very competitive uh let's start there real quick you know was that was it always a goal of yours to be competitive as a gymnast or is that something that you just kind of fell into yeah so the whole gymnastic story actually was when i think back about it it's a bit of a fairy tale type of thing um, I remember sitting down watching the 1990 Commonwealth Games and watching Nikki Jenkins from New Zealand win gold on vault. And I actually just turned around and said to my mum, after watching her get her medal, I want to do that. I want to do gymnastics and I want to go to the Commonwealth Games. And I think that was at the age of five, I said that out loud. And then I started, it wasn't until like a few years later, we grew up really, really poor. So we weren't able to start gymnastics straight, about, straight away. But when we did, um, it was... First class, I held like a 20, 30 second handstand. Next minute I was in the competitive class. And then from there, it just went from eight to 12. I went straight into the elite stream and we went to the Commonwealth Games. And it was purely because of that intention that I had set as a five-year-old that I wanted to go there. And so I think that just kind of stuck with me the entire time as I was training and going through the ranks. But I think from a very young age, I learned, you know, if you have something in your sights, just work to get it. And, you know, I guess as a parent, and maybe you can't, you can't answer this on behalf of your parents, but like, <laughs> as kids, we say, we say things like, I want to be a professional footballer, I want to be a professional rugby player all the time. So, you know, you saying as a five-year-old, like, how much belief as a, as a small child do you actually have? And, you know, I guess how much like, of a vision do you have that this is actually what I want to pursue and I want to do everything to achieve that? Um, I don't think you know it's ever going to happen, and but I'm glad that my mum had the foresight to see that I had a bit of a talent to be able to, be able to move my body, and I saw someone do a backflip, and I went to a trampoline, and I taught myself how to do one. So I think from that little inkling, my mum knew, okay, this kid wants to do it. Let's give her the best and every opportunity to give her the best possible chance to get there. So I think her channeling me in that direction, and um, you know watching just watching things on tv and you want to do something if you want to do it i found at that age i just kind of went fearlessly into it which as a child is really really good i think as an adult we kind of lose that fearlessness and um yeah i put it down to being a little bit fearless and just going for it 
And, you know, that, that time in gymnastics, what age did that take you up to? The time in gymnastics, I started when I was eight years old and I competed in my first Commonwealth Games at 14. My second Commonwealth Games uh, as an 18 year old and then I moved on to collegiate career at the age of 21 or 22. Okay, so I have to be honest and say that I don't know too much about gymnastics and what, what typical ages are where someone's going to be representing their country at the Commonwealth yep. Games. But <laughs> it sounds like as a 14 year old, you're probably younger than the average competitor at Commonwealth Games. Would I be correct in saying that? That is correct, yeah. Gymnastics is such a young sport. Um, the, more, the younger you are, the more agile you are. You pick up skills a lot faster and that whole fearlessness thing is, comes into play when learning skills. Um, it is a young sport. And so 14, it was kind of the norm back in the day. 14 to 16 is where we used to peak. Given now the sport's changed, athletes seem to be peaking a little bit later. But yeah, back then it was a very, very young sport. And so why did you, why did you decide to finish that? Why did, why did gymnastics come to an abrupt ending? It's just the life cycle of the sport. The body takes a lot of wear and tear and um, you just can't do it for as long as you'd like to. I mean, there are some gymnasts out there just completely smashing the norm. Oksana Chusevitna, for one example, I think she's 40 something and still competing in the Olympics. That's just yeah. an anomaly in the sport. But yeah, the wear and tear of the body and then life happens. And so you can't dedicate as much time to training and being at that top level of your game. I mean, it's a full-time job as a 14 year old kid on top of yeah. doing school. That was a lot to handle back then. So doing it as an adult while trying to take on life is probably not that feasible. Well, at least I thought until I found CrossFit. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. Before we get it, before we get into that transition, you know, what parts of life starts to take away from your ability to be a full-time athlete in gymnastics? For me, it was, wanting to move on, just doing the collegiate experience and having more fun. It's such an intense sport. And um, my body was so beat up after my elite career that I was very lucky to even get four years of collegiate gymnastics out of my body. So the wear and tear of the body is mainly the big thing. Can't last uh, okay. for that long. In, in gymnastics, like specifically with events that you're doing, what wear and tear do we see? Or what's common? Um, there's heaps of things. There's broken bones. There's slip discs in your backs. I have had few, like three broken hands. Um, just the ankle injuries from short landings out of tumbling passes. I mean, tumbling passes generate how many ten times of your body weight through each pass. Yeah. Like every time you land, that's a lot. And you see a lot of Achilles ruptures during gymnastics years, purely because of that fact. Um, so yeah, it's just so much wear and tear through the hips, through the joints your knees, everything, that by the time you finish and you get out of it, you've got joints of like a 50-year-old. Yeah, and I think it's really important to understand like whenever you're committing yourself to a, to a sport, like you're also accepting that there's going to be these injuries that are almost a part of the parcel whenever you're doing that much repetitive strain, right? That is true. And I think when you go into the elite side of gymnastics, that's when you're going into the extreme sport of it. Um, that's when you get the wear and tear. The fun part, recreational part, fun part of gymnastics, you don't get as bad wear and tear, but I mean, it's, you know, risk reward. How far do you want to go with the sport? You've got to give everything you can to it. Right. And at that age, we want to get to that top level. And so we push as hard as we can continually. All right. So you, 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 you make this decision because life's getting in the way and you can't dedicate fully towards being a gymnast. What happens next? Um, for me, it was, I went to college, so I got to do gymnastics and train, uh, gymnastics and go to school, get my college paid for, which was lovely. It was the best experience ever. Made so many good friends. Um, and that was to help me transition into normal everyday life and to get a full-time job and that kind of thing. Um, to be quite honest, after retiring from gymnastics and for training so many hours per week, I retired a little bit lost. <laughs> a lot of people get that from competitive sport. They finish and it's just... You don't quite know what to do with yourself. Having that competitive drive on a daily basis and then all of a sudden having nothing was very hard to adjust to. I thought I'd fill that gap with doing some postgraduate studies and then I realized it wasn't quite for me. Um, and then I ended up getting a little bit sick. So that kind of dictated my path from there. Right. So, I mean, if you're open to sharing, I'd love to hear about like what, what did that sickness look like? Yeah. So I... I had some surgery on my stomach and then I ended up uh, with a bilateral pulmonary embolism. 
So clots in my lungs and I went from a point of being able to do so much to not being able to do anything at all. I couldn't even walk to the post box without curling over pretty much. So that whole next six months, I was on blood thinners and just trying to regain lung capacity to a point where I could function like a normal human being. So, yeah. And where, and where, does, that, where does that come from? Is that just a stroke of bad luck or is that something that you, was going on in life that made you get that? It was a bit of bad luck, to be quite honest. I'm just one of those people that if something bad's to happen, I'm that one out of how many thousand that it happens to. <laughs> and Some you just good things roll happen with to it. <laughs> Great things happen, but the bad things, you just got to roll with it. Okay. So I, I mean, if I'm trying to imagine what the next steps are now, and I'm imagining somewhere now from the sickness, you, you yeah. think about CrossFit. So let, what happens next? You, you're dealing with the sickness, you're recovering from it. What happens? So I was dealing with my sickness and I had set goals literally when I got out of hospital well, I suppose it started in the hospital, literally walking was my goal to walk around the wards. And then once I got out of hospital, I've always been a fit person. So it was to regain fitness and health. That was my goal. And I'd set goals to walk from the mailbox to the next lamppost. And then from there, the next lamppost after that, and the next lamppost after that. And then I'd set a goal to walk slash run a 5k. And that was within six months. And then within a year, I made the goal to progress to a half marathon. So that whole year was just walking and running, trying to get back to everyday life, trying to get into a rhythm of life with a job and trying to regain my fitness. And then that's how I got to half marathon level. And then I got bored of half marathons about six months later. <laughs> then well, entered CrossFit. I mean, okay, please continue. <laughs> so yeah, I'd moved to Sydney and um, uh, I think at the age of 29 or 30, I would started working an admin job somewhere in a completely different field to what I graduated in and I was looking for another challenge so I googled a different way to get fit and I found CrossFit. Emailed the local CrossFit gym, got a response back straight away from CrossFit Active and then I showed up the next day to a class with Luke Starr who's my current coach now. Starry, what a legend. Good old star. Okay. Yep. So you rock up to the gym for your first day of CrossFit, did you love it, did you hate it? Um, I was, so I actually walked in and there was a level two class going on, which was the competitive stream and they were slamming weights down and I had never lifted a barbell. So I didn't know what that was about. I got a little bit intimidated. So I walked in, I saw the class and I walked out straight away. I called Lima on the phone, my partner. And at the time I was like, I can't do this. They're, they're just too ridiculous. They're, they're insane. I don't know what they're doing. He goes, just hang up and walk in the gym. So I did. I hung up. I walked in the gym. I think I was approached by Pat Fitzsimons. He made me feel super welcome. And then I joined in the class and I loved every second of it. <laughs> Absolutely every second of it. I think the first thing we did was strict pull-ups and I was super pumped to get in and do some pull-ups. Um, Star came over to me and he was like, hey, um, yeah, we're doing strict pull-ups. Here's a band. Would you like to do pull-ups with a band? And I was like, oh, no, I think I, think I can do a couple. From gymnastics days, pull-ups was a regular thing. So yeah, we ended up doing some pull-ups and then we did this wad. It was super simple. Can't remember what the wad was, but I remember just being absolutely dead. And I knew from then on, this was the mental challenge I needed. Okay. So did you need encouraging coming back to your second session or the coach was like, this girl's got potential. We're snapping her up. No, no. Um, I, I was very scared about getting really bulky, but I did love the fitness side of things. So Talking with the coaches, they explained to me, you don't have to lift weights if you don't want to. Just come in and just, you know, keep getting fit. And plus, we started in an on-ramp class and the group that I started with were fresh eyed, never had done much fitness at all. And it, it was the community aspect of it, I think, that kept bringing me back. Mm. Okay, so what, what, did that early, what did that early journey with CrossFit look like? Were you just a part of group classes? Yep. <laughs> so... <laughs> Fundamentals was called on ramp at the time, and um, it was you know you learn the basic snatch, the basic, pretty much how to squat, basics of pressing, and all those movements. And you're supposed to stay in there for I think two weeks. Um, I'm pretty sure I stayed in there well over a month, closer to two. And then it wasn't until Adam Perry said to me, "Hey, come on, I think it's time you go into the normal classes." And I was a bit hesitant to go to the normal classes because you know I thought I. I coincided that with lifting heavy weights and I, as a gymnast, I didn't want to lift heavy weights. I didn't want to get injured. I felt already broken. Um, so I stayed on really, really, really light weights 
And after the two months or close to two months in on ramp, I finally moved into the classes. And I did group classes for the next nine months. And I didn't lift much weight at all. I was too scared to. And then it wasn't until someone said, oh, you've kind of got a little bit in this. I was like, okay, yeah, let's see what else we can learn. So I'm interested as a gymnast who's had, you know, a history of injuries, you come into a CrossFit gym, you know, people, I think there's definitely a general uh, understanding that gymnasts are really good movers. They seem to pick up CrossFit really quickly, but there are also things that gymnasts often struggle with as well, particularly like lower body based work uh, from a mobility and a strength standpoint. So what did you find, you know, coming with gymnastics background into a CrossFit gym? What did you excel at other than the gymnastics, of course, and what did you really struggle with? Yeah, so the lower extremity strength is something that I definitely struggle with. I mean, I still do today, but hey, we've all got weaknesses, right? <laughs> um, the lower body strength, I really struggled with squatting. I remember I could actually push jerk more than I could squat when I first mm. came in. That clearly shows you just how much upper body strength the gymnast has. Um, yeah, so one thing with when I started CrossFit is that the weightlifting, because I was so weak, because I struggled with it so much, I decided to go down that route and actually just start the sport. But there's a huge part that's missing here. You know, you, you're getting it, <laughs> you're, you're in group classes and you yep. just, you group class for nine months, you're not lifting anything heavy, you're keeping things light. You know, where does this journey now roll on to? Um, it rolls into realizing I wasn't good at weightlifting and then starting into the competitive class when I finally get, got invited to it. And okay, so as an invite thing, how long did that take you? Um, it wasn't until the December before or the January before the Open that I decided to go into that class. And then once I got into the class, I realized I had the skills, I didn't have the strength, and then they were doing team selections. So when the team selections happened, I got told I wasn't quite good enough to be in the first team. And there and behold, that sparked the competitive streak of, oh, I don't like that. <laughs> I think I'd like a chance to compete for a spot on the first team. And that's when my perspective uh, just changed from doing this for fun to get healthy to, oh, let's see what I can get out of my body and let's put some intent towards our training. And it was then that I put intent to training and then competed the next open and qualified as an individual, I think. But then fought for my spot on the team for CrossFit Active. You know what? Alika, you're just too bloody humble. I want to, I, I need you to, you know, but, but, okay. So firstly, the first thing I'm listening to here is like, I'm remembering team selections at my gym and like team selections were horrendous because it made, it made me think about lunchtime football. You know, when you get selected for your team and you like, no one wants to be the last person selected. It's all mates selecting each other, which makes it way harder as well. For us, we didn't have like a selection criteria, but it was just like, well, yeah, I kind of think you're going to be better on the team than you are. And, you know, and someone's going to have a, a broken heart and it's going to be horrible for everyone. What was team sessions like for you guys over there? Um, for us, Active was so competitive. They still are. Like even back in the day, everyone wanted to make teams or wanted to go to regionals as an individual. Um, the team had been to the games the year before. So they were like the creme de la creme. You want to get into that team. Um, so yeah, it was pretty intense. I mean, I didn't quite fully understand what was going on with CrossFit. I still didn't know what the open was about, so I hadn't done one yet, but all I knew was that being told I wasn't good enough at that time sparked something that made me realize, you know, I'm not quite done with being competitive. And did you end up making the first team that year? We ended up making the first team. Yep. And then we placed second at regionals and made it to the games and finished, I think, fifth place, the highest cross, the highest Australasian team to finish at the games. Okay, so in within a couple, a few months of you just moving into a competitive class, you then go to regionals and then you get the, you then go to the CrossFit Games in that same year. What an experience! Huge experience. It was a huge eye opener because I le I learned through everybody's experiences. So I. I do take on board what everyone's doing and I watch and I see around me what's going on. And I, I think once I knew I wanted to make a team, I found out what the milestones I needed to hit in order to get to that first team. And I spoke to the coaches and they gave me those milestones and I made sure that by the time those selections came up, 
I worked my ass off to get each one of those milestones done. And so I think that's what helped me progress quite quickly from there. And you know, you've, before that you'd competed, I mean, gymnastics is kind of a team sport, but it's pretty much an individual sport. I mean, is it not team because you know, it's a collaborative team score at the end of the day, but essentially it's you out on the floor. So what was that like transitioning into a team, a team sport, having really you know, done an individual sport your whole life? Yeah, so working with people at the same time was definitely um, a bit of an eye opener for me. Um, you know, as an individual, you're very selfish and you want to get your job done, but it is a collective thing. You're doing something for the good of the team as a whole. So learning to work with people was actually, you know, quite an eye opener. Um, but in terms of my best year of CrossFit, I still say to this day that that was probably the most fun I have had in CrossFit, being able to do it as a team. And that first year at the CrossFit Games uh, with Active, when you finished fifth, like what's that experience like? Oh, pretty epic. Except I do remember um, we had, it was the first year of Big Bob where we had the hot rig out in the sun. And I just remember coming off and my hands were absolutely burnt and ripped, like the whole palm of my hands. So the rest of the games was horrible, but the end result was pretty bloody awesome. And, you know, when you left the games that year, yeah. were you hungry for more? Yeah, so that's, that was another story. I remember sitting in the stands and I was watching China Cho climb the rope in the final heat. And I turned to Adam Perry and I said to him, that's pretty cool. I wouldn't mind. I want to do that. You know, just, it was a drunken conversation. I'm not going to lie. We were drunk in the stands because we were finished. And um, yeah, so when I said that to Adam Perry in the stands and he was like, oh yeah, I can help you get there. I'm like, nah, no way. I'm not good enough. And then actually next thing we knew, we came home a month later and we had a chat. And he was like, do you want to kind of try? I was like, yeah, we'll try. So the goal, the goal oh. for the next year was to come like top heat at regionals. We thought there'd be a transition year, but no, it didn't happen like that. So, I mean, okay, interesting part there is that, you know, when you made this commitment to go individual, you already had it fixed in your head that you were getting to regionals. That was the goal straight away. Yeah. Because it's not, it's not like, reg I know maybe a lot of our listeners probably don't remember what regionals were or weren't in the sport when <laughs> regionals was a thing. But I mean, like it wasn't still an, an, uh, like a shoe in especially in Oz where the standard was really high. Like getting to regionals is a pretty amazing feat in itself. Yeah, it, it was a big deal. Like I knew how hard it was to get there and people trained so hard just to make it in there. So to me, that was a reasonable goal, uh, rather achievable goal, but still a challenge. So how was that first year at regional? 2015, you go to regionals as an individual for the first time. Talk us through that. Yeah. Um, going to regionals is the first time. I'm glad that I'd gone the team the year before because that experience definitely opened my eyes as to what to expect. Um, as we got to regionals, I think the lead up and the training towards regionals, testing out all the workouts, I just remember being beaten hands down by everyone in the gym, like the Courtney Fitzharris's, the Justin Beats and Harriet Roberts. Everyone just did their workouts and I was getting slammed because I used to train early in the morning or late at night. So I never got to train during the day to see what they were doing. But they did great times. And then going into regionals, I thought, oh, okay, I'll just do my best. We'll see how it goes. Um, but then after the first workout, I think it was Randy, and I placed second. I think that's when I kind of opened my eyes. And I remember Lima opened his eyes and was thinking, what the hell? This girl might actually do all right. And then it wasn't until we progressed on during that weekend that we realized, okay, we could probably do something here. And so why is that? You know, you're, you're in the lead up, you're doing these workouts in the gym, but suddenly, and you're losing to everyone, suddenly you're on the competition floor and you're finishing second. What is that? So it's, it's a lot of adrenaline that goes into it as well. But I think also when I train, when I test out a workout, I would do it just to feel something, just to feel what it feels like. And then I would, wouldn't test the workout again. I would actually tailor a program to train the workouts to try and get better at it. So I never test the whole one again. And so I remember with Randy, that particular workout, because I got beaten so badly in training, I thought, okay, I'm just gonna train everything just you know, 10 to 15 pounds heavier, just do Tabata style workouts, and then we'll have a go on the day. And you know, lo and behold, what I did, that intentional training, that deliberate practice paid off when it mattered. Okay, so I'm interested in that strategy because 
you know, for some people, it's like the pure act of repetition of doing the workout over and over again as it's prescribed. Like you're learning something every time you do it. You know, maybe it's like, even if it's just from a strategy standpoint, obviously your approach there was, you know, you did it once at sub-maximal intensity, then just trained it and then actually didn't do it again until you got onto the competition floor. So, you know, when you're on the floor, did you have a strategy going into it? And is this, is this a strategy that you've actually used in, you know, throughout your CrossFit career in terms of how you prep for competition? It actually is. It ended up working that particularly that I kept the template moving forward in terms of how I approached wads. Um, the first time, I try not to do wads full tilt unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, my body gets beat up really, really quickly. So I, I don't push my body to the limits very often. I have to pick and choose when I do that. So when training for the competition, I do something for feel, then I train it intentionally. And that one time that you have to do it, just putting a bit of pressure on yourself to do it right that one time helps me to execute it to the, to the level that I want to execute it at. Does that make yeah. sense? <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I actually love it because I think we have this perception that crossfitters especially especially the ones you know at the game at the top of the sport they they have this unbelievable capacity to go 100 percent all the time and for the rest of us we kind of look at them and think well i'm never going to be that that athlete because i don't have the capacity to do that but you know you just said there that actually the majority of your time is spent doing submaximal work and that's yeah. what actually allows you because you know your body and you know understand that if you do it's gonna not allow you to to have longevity in the sport that's exactly it. And always at the forefront of my mind is longevity in what I do. Yeah, you know, so it's like for us, it's no different to the message that we're trying to give our clients and our members all the time that we want longevity in this. And I guess, you know, you've taken that model and applied it to actually the sport side of things, which is pretty amazing. I would, I would imagine, Alethea, there's when you haven't run through the workout at full tilt in training, yep. that there's a, there's a likelihood or there's a higher chance that when you get to the competition, it could sometimes go really well like Randy did, and it could probably sometimes go catastrophically terribly. Has yeah. that ever happened? Um, apart from the games where things go catastrophically wrong, um, in terms of regionals, other than injury, everything seems to work out, not necessarily as I expected, but in some sort of way, how I had envisioned. So I always, when I'm going into a competition or a workout, there I'm trying to compete. I think of my best case scenario and I visualize that through from beginning to end in detail. Then I visualize what I, what the worst case scenario is, which I know some people think is terrible because you know, self-fulfilling prophecy, it might happen, but no, I prepare myself for the best case. I prepare myself for the worst case. And I also prepare myself for what happens if worst case is happening. What do, how do I cope with that in that moment? So I have strategies to deal with each thing as it's happening. So that when it if when and if it does happen, I'm prepared for all. Okay, I love that, and we're going to talk about that. But I mean, I I do remember reading uh, Michael Phelps in Beijing when he won his I think it was eight gold medals. They would practice for his goggles to fall off. So you know that was visualization and actual practice of worst case scenario. If this happens, like what are you going to do? And I think in actually one of the events, his goggles do fall off. And for him, he was like, well, well I, I visualized that day happening for the last four years. So when that actually happened, it, it actually wasn't a big deal at all. So I, I would love to hear kind of your take on how you go through that visualization process of best case, worst case, and, you know, the middle ground. Yeah. Um, so it's literally just that. So I actually just sit down by myself. I, I close my eyes and I visualize my thought process I think about what I'm thinking going into each workout I think about how I'm going to approach it I think about where I'm doing it and I just try and picture what's happening and I try to do all sensory things so I try to think about what I can smell what I can feel what I can hear and then I go through it from beginning to end good case scenario me on top of the podium worst case scenario I don't finish the workout I absolutely bomb and then how I adjust what do I do to reframe if things are going wrong and usually in that moment i'll um i'll set anchor words for the workouts so if something is not good i will think of my uh, well, actually i have an action which i normally do which is i stomp my right foot and that means to just center myself and get back to what i was supposed to be doing so i don't know 
not yeah, too I good mean, at explaining do, what I do. I've been no, doing it for so sure. long that it's like. Yeah, but where, we know, are these things that, when did, where did these stem from? Because I, that's like you, the way that you say it is from such a seasoned com, competitor standpoint. It's obviously something that's just comes very naturally for you, which is why you're like, it's hard to explain. But, you know, where did you pick these things up? Was this part of gymnastic days? It's definitely the gymnastics days because the skills are so complex and the beam routines and anything you do, if you fall, it's, it's a mistake. So you're taught to visualize it all in your head so that you can execute it cleanly when you go out. And so I take that same approach into how I approach CrossFit. But yeah, it was from reading books on sports psychology when I was like 12 or 13 years old. Um, my mum would just hand me something and yeah, would go from there. And you know, at what point are you doing these visualizations of the worst case scenario? Because, you know, sometimes you visualize a worst case scenario just before you go out and do a performance, you actually end up doing the worst case scenario. No, so, you know, no. at, at, which, at which part in the prep does, does, is that an important thing to do? Um, usually for me, it's probably maybe if I know the workout in advance, I will do it straight away. Like this is what I can see being the best case scenario because I know because I know my body so well, I know what I could possibly get if a, rip, if a workout's written out. I can know what times I should be aiming for. And then I visualize that. Um, if it's, yeah, just worst case scenario, you kind of just go through. But it's definitely not right before you go out. It's probably a week in advance or even like three days in advance. You visualize it and then you try and block it out as well. So visualize it, put it in the bank for if it's needed. But you try to go towards best case scenario. Mm. Okay, well, awesome. Tell me about this first year at the CrossFit Games as an individual in 2015. 2015. Um, yeah, I was super excited to make it. And then next thing I knew, we had to swim. Mm, ah, yes. I, okay, I remember this one. Yeah, so I'm not the best swimmer. I actually only started to learn swimming because I made the CrossFit Games. And I could not swim more than 10 meters in a pool. And we had to swim one kilometer in the ocean. So... For me, that wasn't, I had to learn as well as I could to survive the open water. And that's what that year was, survive the open water. And for me, that was a mental challenge just to get through. So it was actually a lot more mental prep in terms of that. Um, and then how to pick myself back up to be able to compete in the rest of the workouts. Um, but that whole experience was just incredible. Because that was the, the swim workout was the very first workout, was it not that year? It was, it was the very first workout. I think it was 500 swim around the pier and then a mile on the paddleboard and then it's yeah. 500 swim again. Yeah. That's I, just right. remember, I just remember Easy Muhammad just chilling because he yeah, did not want to do that. that second swim. Easy was just having a nap on his paddleboard, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, you know, with, with that event coming out as the very first event, you know, yeah. what, did you have expectations coming into the games? Do you have any goals? Um, I honestly, no, I had, my goal was to just show up to the games and just put forth the best package that I could. And given that I knew I was going to take a massive hit in strength and swimming, I just tried to capitalize on the events that I knew that I could do well. And for me, that year was Murph. Mm, yeah. Talk us through it. That's the year that Cara and everyone was dropping like flies, right? It was blinking hot. I'm not going to lie. Even that little island girl thought that that was hot. That was crazy hot. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you did really well in that workout, I remember. Where did you finish that one? Yeah, so that workout I ended up finishing second. Um, I think the partition, the way they did it of the 100, 200, 300 worked out well for me because it ended up being upper body, upper body, and then run. Yeah, that's true. So, mm -hmm. so the push-ups I managed to get through quite, like, decently normally i'd think you'd get through like sets of five no way everyone we were reduced to twos and threes if we could it was so hot um but that whole time i remember everyone pouring drinks over their head but i'm not sure if i saw many people actually drinking it yeah so that that's was where they went that's where they went wrong oh that too but the heat the heat's ridiculous like i'm not gonna lie that was definitely you had to go to a place of absolute grit just to get through that one yeah, it looked completely, completely savage. And what were your biggest learnings out of that experience at the Games that year? First year as an individual. My first year as an individual, I realized that I was weak. And that's all I took out of it was that I was weak and my legs, sorry, lower limb strength. I was weak and I needed to learn to swim. 
And so <laughs> that's, that pretty much focused my whole next year of training. So you've obviously, by this point, you've got a competitive drive. You're like, this is, yeah. this is what I want to do now. Right. So are you just, are you someone who just takes these things year by year or did you set up, you know, a plan now to, for the next three years, I'm going to be competing at CrossFit Games. Like, how does it work for you? No, for me, um, I consider these my bonus years in terms of competing. I never thought I'd ever be able to compete in any other sport again because my body was so beat up. But um, with CrossFit, it's, it's a season by season and it has to be a competition by competition. So I don't get to compete in a lot of things outside sanctional events or outside regionals because my body wouldn't be able to handle it. So we pick and choose events that we target and we just go for those. So everything's periodized and everything's with a purpose. And I think that's how I've managed to get to like quite a few CrossFit games. And so like, what, what's the key Alethea? Like for someone who's been able to compete all these years with a really broken body, because, you know, more broken than probably most people who are quitting in CrossFit much sooner than you are. You know, what's the key recipe here for like longevity and success in this training modality? Whether you're someone who's just in a CrossFit gym who's training or you're someone who wants to be an athlete and be competing at maybe local competitions or maybe even look into things like the open sanction events and maybe even the games. Like, how do you do it? Um, it's, you hear everyone talking about the one percenters and looking after the body. Uh, it's a lot of priming and um, prehab work and mobility work. And it's all directions that I get from coaches or from health professionals, chiros, physios. We identify weaknesses in the body and we work them. And that comes before the actual fun of doing the sexy stuff, which is CrossFit, lifting a barbell. We take care of mobility. We take care of activation. We take care of all that recovery. And then we do all the fun stuff. But we do that stuff well, the fun stuff flies. So if you can and how, how much does like the mind play into this? Like how much do you read into things like stress management, mindfulness, uh, environment, relationships? Like that stuff could all, you know, potentially have its weight on the way that an athlete can perform and recover. Do you think about that stuff as well? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think early on in my CrossFit years, the 2015, 2016 years, I probably neglected the mindfulness a little bit too much. I just kept, I fell into the trap of trying to go a little bit harder. Um, and it wasn't until I actually got injured that I realized that stuff mattered. Um, but what you do during the day, your work stresses, your life stresses, how your body's feeling, you know, you've got to find, you've got to actually listen to what your body's telling you. And when you go into the gym, adjust your program accordingly. If you don't, if you can't go full tilt, don't go sub maximal, but pick something to work on that's intentional and get that intentional practice out that you want to get out. Don't just go and try to hit everything at once. You know, I think picking purposeful things really makes a difference in the overall picture. And you know, for someone who's listening and they're like, okay, I, I, I get what she's saying. How do I know if, you know, my body is not in a position to be pushing hard or is it just me being lazy or undisciplined or unmotivated? You know, how do we discern the difference? You know, there's a few things that I go through. There's all this tech that you can use. I mean, there's whoop, there's going by your Garmin, there's going by, um, you know, all that technical stuff, but also just keeping a journal about how you're feeling each day. Um, if after your session, you're feeling rubbish, write it down. And then if you can look by the end of the week, you're like, oh, I felt rubbish like five days in a row. I, that's an indication, you know what? I need to just take a chill pill. Maybe just do some, give myself a bit of self-love and take a few days to build back up. But yeah. So, so where, when, are you, yeah, when are you doing your journaling? Is it, is it every session after? Is it before a session? Is it mornings? Is it nights? And what are the questions you're asking yourself? Yeah. So for me, I journal in the mornings and I actually update what I did the day before in my training. I make notes to how I was feeling or if I'm feeling rubbish. And then I move into my actual day plan of, you know, gratitude and then how I feel and what I want to get out of the day. But the morning, a little bit like 10 to 15 minutes, that's all I have time for. But that's enough time for me to actually just put purpose to what I need to do and figure out, do I need to back off today or can I go extra hard? And you said like you reflect on the week, like you look back on scores. Is that something you do every week? Um, it actually is. So I do update my program for my coach daily. 
and I make comments and then we pick up on patterns. I mean, they're kind of important, especially if you're trying to plan the next week. How have you done this week and how is it going to affect the week after? I not only have to be fresh for training, you kind of have to still be fresh for work. So I've kind of got to be able to manage both and make sure that, you know, the mind's sharp and the body's still capable. So for you, because I mean, everyone shows stress and fatigue in different ways. What are the ways that you typically start to show it? Mine is actually through pain. So my pain tends to increase when I'm really quite stressed and I can feel things a lot more, which that's a true indication that, you know, I need to back off. So unfortunately, my training is dictated by pain, but it's something that can be quite easily managed. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting. I, I, I've myself had a lot of injuries in the past and always mm-hmm. when I'm in an overreaching phase of any, of any form or just stress is starting to, to catch up with me. It's always highlighted in all the places I've had operations, basically. All those areas start to really show themselves in the most innocuous activities and movements. And yeah, for me, it's exactly the same thing. But, you know, there are some people who genuinely don't feel anything different physically. They really can't tell the difference between a good day and a, and a less, less than ideal day. So it's hard. Yeah, I think that's where tracking things actually comes into play. And if, I mean, if you track accurate data, the data doesn't lie. So you can see whether you're on the downward or you're on the upward trajectory. And so what, you know, what are some of the typical changes that you make to your program when you, when you speak to your coach and you say, right, I need to back it off a little bit today. You're not, not training. You're still getting in. You're no. doing something. You, you talked about intent and purpose. What does that look like for maybe a strength session? And what does that look like for, let's say, like a conditioning type session? Yeah. So if it's something like a strength session and I'm, my joints are not feeling it and I can't push the weights or numbers that I need to, I take it back down to a technique focus. And that means super submaximal weights. But the precision in which I practice needs to be on point. And I get satisfaction out of that as well. Like it may not be the numbers, but if I can move something quite well and I feel that, like, not that, well, it is kind of like a perfect lift in a session, that's a win. So I take those wins when and where they come. If it's a workout and it's heavily CrossFit oriented, I don't necessarily go full tilt, but I do pick a movement or two movements that I need to push to be able to feel like I've achieved something out of it. So a good example was, the other day in a star strength camp, I had a workout with overhead lunging and chest to bar workout and everyone was doing it for speed. I couldn't do it for speed. I just didn't have it in me that day. But I did have the purpose of going in and doing all the chest to bars unbroken. It was 35, 25, 15, I think. And for me, that skill practice definitely paid off in terms of what I wanted to get out of that workout. So picking a purpose, picking a focus, you still get something out of it. You still get the mental like drive that, yes, I can still do this. I can still improve. And um, yeah, that just helps me on days that I'm not really feeling that great. I love that. I love the idea of picking like uh, just part of a workout and really putting focus and intent to that. You know, I've, I do find that a lot of people, even when they try to implement these things, they still can't help but compare to what them at their best was like. So, you know, the fact that they had to do this for quality means that they're not getting as fit as they want to be because last month they did it and did it in half the time. You know, how do you stop that comparison as a person where like you're just being so present and focused on what you have in front of you today and not comparing it to the past or the future? Like, how do you discern from that? You know, I still struggle with that because I am getting a bit older, so I'm not quite as fast as what I used to be. But you still, if you just, I truly believe in being where your feet are and being where your feet are means being completely present in your present stage of life. You have to be okay with where you're at, at, but know that that's not the end game. Like there's still room to progress. And if you keep remembering that you're just progressing or you're on the road to getting better always, that's a way to kind of keep yourself in check. Like, who cares if you don't, you're not as good as what you used to be. You're definitely better in so many other areas and you have to kind of just focus in and zero in on that. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Good advice. What, you know, that some point here, I believe it might be 2018, you got struck with another bout of pretty bad injury. I think there might be another day before that. Can you, what was, what was some of those biggest injuries you had as a CrossFitter? 
As a CrossFitter, um, well, yeah, we can't move past the 2016 CrossFit Games where I ruptured my Achilles on the box jump workout. And I, I knew going into that workout, any time I rebound box jump, it was a high risk for me. Not because I don't do it, just because my tendons are quite worn after gymnastics. But it was an event that I knew I could do well at, so I went in knowing full well it could go. And after the 13th box jump, it went, and I knew straight away, yeah, it had gone. Um, but then after that, we'd re managed to recover, come back the next year, made it to the CrossFit Games. And then after the CrossFit Games, um, I was training again, and silly me, didn't listen to my body that day, early morning running and sprinting. I partially tore my post tib tendon on the left leg. And this was, I think, in October, November, and I had trials for Com Games, I think, in January or February. So it was a really mad rush and a bit of a hush hush time to keep the injury secret, but we made it to the Commonwealth Games the next year. So that was the other injury. Those are the two injuries I've had in CrossFit, which, if you think about it, after all the hours of training, that's actually not that bad. Yeah. I mean, I want to get back to Commonwealth Games in a second, but you know, what is your process of dealing with injury? You know, you've, you're someone who's had a lot of it in the past. Uh, you know, like how do you, how do you remain positive? How do you get yourself back to still, you know, being on the same on the same track with the same goals? Yeah, what's that process look like for you? Yeah, the, so recovering from injury. In terms of 2016, for me, that was a huge lesson. Um, I actually allowed myself to feel two weeks. I gave myself a timeline, two weeks of feeling absolutely rubbish. I cried. I let myself wallow in my own self-pity. I ate whatever I wanted to. I relaxed everything. I was not strict at all. And then after that two weeks time was up, I got straight back on the train of, okay, what makes me happy? Where do I want to be? And then I just make a plan. And so that plan was wasn't even anything to get to the games. I just set a long-term goal of being able to do the open as a scaled athlete because I didn't think I'd be able to jump by the time the open ran around. Um, and so to do that, I knew I had to go to the gym every day. And so for me, it was just setting that small milestone. And that stayed my milestone for, I think, two or three months was just to get to the gym every day for a month. So once that hit, I mean, there were days that I didn't want to go at all, but the act of just showing up and going to the gym definitely helped to build momentum. And I'm a true believer in the whole small wins keeps building momentum. So every day I showed up to the gym with a small win and those small wins accumulated to a point where I was running and jumping to close to full capacity after six months. But that's how I approach injury pretty much. Just keep, it, keep going for those small milestones and just see where they get you. I love that. I love the, uh, the idea that, you know, you just, it's the difference between discipline and motivation. It's like, even when you're not motivated, the act of discipline is that you just have to get it done anyway, because, but you know, that's not possible for you unless you'd actually built that plan, which you yeah. knew that the discipline was actually moving you somewhere that was worth getting to. Something else I actually really picked up on there, which I love is it's actually okay to, to be upset and, and to wallow in self pity. Like you need that time. Yeah, I mean, you can't, it's hard to pretend that nothing's wrong. Something is wrong, and it's okay to acknowledge it as long as you know that give yourself a time frame. And I felt that putting a time frame on that for me helped me just completely get rid of it all, and it helped me move forward just that little bit easier. Yeah. I mean, in speaking to you, Alicia, like I'm learning so much more about how much you actually think about all of this, that, you know, this yeah. is all like – it's the behind the scenes stuff that's like, it's so, so damn important if you want to be like excel at anything. So, I mean, this is great. Just thank you for sharing. That's just a little, <laughs> thank side, you. A, little a little side tangent. Okay, talk me through Commonwealth Games, Olympic lifting now. You know, you yep. just told us in this story that you realize that you're not going to pursue weightlifting when you first started CrossFit because you weren't strong enough. Why now are you suddenly in a position where you're going to potentially represent your country in weightlifting? It's in me. Any time that I find that it's hard or it's something I'm not good at, I see it as an opportunity for growth and to learn. So for me, it was, I'm weak in my legs. Well, okay, I'm not going to be strong. I'm not going to be group brute strong, but I can definitely get technically proficient. And that was how I got into weightlifting. My aim was to just to learn the technique, learn how to be efficient, and hopefully that would carry over into CrossFit. Um, 
it did. It hundred percent did. I can move weight well. I think my front squat at the time, uh, back in the day, was one hundred and one, and my clean was one hundred. So that just shows I'm not technically I'm not strong, but technically proficient. And I think that's what drew me to the sport. And it was good enough to a position where I could throw my name in the hat to be competing at the Commonwealth Games. It was not something that I set out to do, but the opportunity came and I thought, well, I'll be stupid if I didn't try. And what was that experience like? Oh, I, seriously, um, it was so rewarding to know that, like, you put yourself out there doing something you're not good at and you can actually take the stage and represent your country in something that you thought would never be possible. And for me, that feeling was pretty up there in terms of sporting achievements. And, you know, when you were, when you were trying out for the, for the New Zealand team, like, did you have any outcomes? Did you have any expectations? Were there numbers you wanted to hit? Did you want to even try to think about, I don't know, a certain ranking or achievement in terms of placing? Yeah, when I first started out, I thought I'd, you know, I'd want to aim somewhere close to the podium. That was my goal. And then because I got injured so close to the actual competition, everything just changed to, okay, let's just get you out on that stage. Yeah. Um, but, you know, regardless of even if, you know, everybody's journey is different and that journey took a really hard hit. Um, but I'm super glad that I was able to turn it around and make it into something that was super self-gratifying for me. So yeah, 12 weeks out, I injured that posted tendon and then I was still managed to take the stage and get a PB total on the platform. And I took that as a massive win. It may not be a medal, but in terms of my own journey, it was a huge win. Amazing. All right. So, you know, what, what year was that? What year was Commonwealth Games that year? 2018. 2018. Yeah, okay, 20 so years after my first Commonwealth Games appearance. Mental, mental. <laughs> uh, okay, so the next year, you're back at the CrossFit yeah. Games, competing now as a Masters. I mean, it's funny because I think there's naturally I want to jump into a conversation to be like, Alethea, what's the difference between being an athlete competing CrossFit Games yeah. versus now being a Masters athlete? But there's only one year different. But you know what was or two years, I guess. What was what was that experience like firstly just being at the CrossFit Games in a completely different division in a completely different setting uh in a very new year because it was the year of all the national champions and yep. mass changes of sport what was that like for you yeah there was a big big adjustment year for me so after coming to Shanghai and to Hong Kong and doing the qualifiers we did down under we qualified as an individual athlete in the open category but because I had, I was injured and I was working a lot of hours, um, it wasn't the right decision to go as an individual. The time and effort you have to put in to compete as an individual is, is ridiculous just to get through the weekend. And I didn't have that time. So I knew that I could go masters and at least still have that great experience of competitiveness amongst a kick-ass field. Because let's be real, they are legit. Um, it was such a cool experience. I mean, all the masters category, they're really, really fit. So it wasn't as high skilled as I would have liked. It was just pure fitness, which is something I'm not great at, but I thoroughly enjoyed the challenge. So yes, I competed as a master's, but man, it was just as challenging. I'm not going to lie. What were the biggest differences, you know, from being in, yeah. obviously apart from the arena is different. You've got a different crowd watching you, but mm -hmm. you know, like what really caught you by surprise? Um, I don't think anything caught me by surprise. I was actually a little bit disappointed at how the masters are considered like kind of second class it was, in terms of the CrossFit realm. That was a little bit disappointing because a lot of them earn their right to be there and being the top of your field in any category is pretty legit. But the, I think one thing that was actually really good was they made the masters do the same run as the individual with the ruck. Mm. And that was impressive to see that some of the masters could hold their own even in the open category. I was pretty impressed by that. And I was so, not you know, one of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask what you know. What did, what did, what did this experience leave you with? You know, you know, where are you at now, Lethia? Do you do you want to be a returning masters, getting back to the CrossFit Games? Is that still your goal? Or do you want to do team? Do you want to be competitive in the sport? What does the future look like? 
You know, I've always said these were my bonus years competing and they still are. And I truly, I train for the sake of training because I absolutely love it. It's not going to, I'm not going to stop doing it. I'm going to keep doing it. And if I'm ready to compete and if I'm in a position where my standard is good enough to compete, then I'll still compete. I'll probably keep doing it until I can't. I mean, a great example is Lynn Natman. She's from CrossFit Active. She's been to the games every year as a master since it's been in, in the competition. And she keeps doing it because she loves it. And I think that's the culture we have within our gym. And if I'm good enough to compete, I'll still compete. And that kind of happened this year. I mean, I jumped on a team with Star Strength and the team qualified for the games, which unfortunately they don't get to go to. But yeah, same thing. If we're good enough to compete, I'll still keep going. So there's no, there's no timeline on this one. You're just going to keep on, keep on rolling with the punches. And if you're good enough, we'll see you Pretty out much. Yeah, that's pretty much it. And um, I mean... What do they say? It's like the young ones, you shouldn't really give up your spot. Someone should come and take it from you. And that's a sign of respect. I'm like, okay, well, if I can compete in a competitive setting, take it from me. Great. But I, if I'm good enough to go, I'll go. Love it. Okay. The last thing I want to talk about here, which is really the fact you just talked about it there, the fact that you've done all of this whilst also doing a little side hustle, which is basically your main job which occupies a, a large part of every single day. Yet, you know, you somehow make it work where you're able to, you know, get to the highest level in the sport and compete against people who are actually just not in the same position as you. They're people who have freedom to train all day, every day, uh, who don't have another job on the side. So, you know, I guess first, you know, what is it that you do? Uh, why is it that that has stayed something a part of your daily life whilst you continue to pursue, you know, being a CrossFit Games athlete? And I guess the last one, which I'm really interested in, is like, how do you do it? Because I've seen so many Alethea Boone posts on Instagram where it's 10 p.m. at night and you're yeah. grafting away getting a training session. And I'm just like, I'm in my third sleep cycle by this point, wondering how the <laughs> hell you're getting it Wearing done. Wearing your so, blue block sunglasses. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so take us, take us through all of that, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I work in property management and I've done it the whole time since I've been competing in CrossFit, even before then. Um, I graduated with a degree in exercise science, but I don't work in that field at all. I went completely in opposite realm into something that I was not confident in, which is the corporate world. And I absolutely love the challenge that I get out of that. And I think having both CrossFit and working a normal job actually balanced itself quite well. I was able to fully give myself to training when I'm at training and same with work. But training was also, it's always been what I do for fun. Um, my idea of fun is to push myself to the absolute limit, which is why a lot of us do CrossFit. And that carries over into the working world. Um, training late at night, no matter what time I finish, I have to get something done. It's for my mental health. It's, it's what keeps me ticking over and it's what keeps me feeling alive. And that's why I do what I do. And you know what? Doing that just, it helped me get to uh, each of those steps of, CrossFit, I guess, just having that mindset. Okay, so I just want to really quickly, because I, this is obviously something that I personally thought, you know, I read, I'm someone who, I guess like you, has to self-regulate my training a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. I also have other things I'm really passionate about, like my gym and my business. Uh, yeah. And I do find sometimes, you know, training is a non-negotiable for me. It's always going to be a part of every single day. But at the same time, it's about still training without it taking away from my ability to be, you know, the best that I can be you know, as a, in my, in my job for my gym and for the business. So, you know, how do you then balance it? You know, you, you say that it's really important for your mental health. Therefore you're going to get it in no matter what, even if it's nine, 10 PM at night, you know, are you then, is there, I guess my question is, you know, which sits higher in your priority list? Does it mean like you're, you'd much rather get your training session. And if it means that your next day is suboptimal at work, or is it constantly trying to balance both so that you can perform as high as you can in both of them? Um, it highly depends on what my focus is on for the competition cycles, I guess. Mm. If I am training for the games, then I'm a wee bit of a useless human at work, but I try to manage it as much as I can. Um, but if I'm training for the CrossFit Games, hell, you're training for the CrossFit Games, you've got to give it heaps, right? <laughs> mm. So things that, things that took a bit of a backseat was actually sleep. Um, sleep was something that I was neglecting for a very long time sleep maybe four or five hours if i was lucky during the 15 16 17 period and it's not sustainable <clears throat> but it was something that i 
I, I just loved getting up to train for a purpose and it didn't seem like a sacrifice at the time. It was just, let's get up, let's get it done and let's keep moving. Um, but yeah, that's how it was at that stage. Social life definitely took a bit of a backseat. You lose a lot of friends along the way because you're so obsessed over doing well in every aspect of your life that sometimes you lose a bit of that. Um, but the ones that are truly, truly there for you, they're the ones that are still there now. And I mean, it's, it's all about priorities. What do you put focus towards? Um, sporting life is very short lived. So if you're going to go in, you know, I gave it the best I could for as long as I could. But again, now that I'm transitioning out, I'm going through another phase of transition. My priorities change and I'm able to enjoy the other side of things. But it's just a journey. I mean, you want experiences, you want to achieve something, you give it all you've got. And then you can, you know, carry on and find another journey to go on. Awesome. So the future. We don't really know. We may see you back out there on a competition floor. We may not, but you'll be taking it. You'll be taking it one day, one step at a time. Pretty much. And that approach seems to be working for me regardless. So <laughs> we'll see how it goes. But yeah, transitioning out from being an athlete, um, I'm still competing when and where possible. Um, but yeah, I think I'd like to move more into like the coaching and helping other people achieve their fitness goals as well. Amazing. So does that mean we're going to see you take a step away from property and into the coaching field? Mate, if I could make it all work, that would be great. Of <laughs> so I'm still going to so figure it... out a way to make it all work. Yeah. So if any clients are looking for a coach to coach them at 10 p.m. at night, you just give Alethea Boone a call and she'll, uh, she'll sort you out. Yeah, that seems about right, hey? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Alethea, well, listen up, we're going to wrap it up there, uh, but this has been epic. Thank you so much for sharing your story. And I'm going to say it again, this has just been quite mind-blowing for me as to how much actually goes into uh, this is a thought process, uh, which actually allows you to be an athlete like yourself who's competed at such a high level, but has come from, you know, probably not the most ideal uh, background in a sport, you know, coming into a crazy sport with so many injuries. Um, but now it all kind of makes sense after hearing your story as to how you actually do it. Um, for our listeners, Lethia, where can, where can they find out more about you? Um, you can just find out more about me through my Instagram mainly and Facebook. It's Alethea underscore Boone. Um, I'm, my email's listed on there too. So anytime I get a lot of messages about Achilles recovery, so flick me an email. I'm happy to share what I did during my journey and hopefully it'll help you. Awesome. Lethia, thank you so much for this. Uh, you have a great day. You say hi to Lima as well on behalf of myself. Make sure he's not slacking off on that C2 bike, ski and row. I will for sure. Thanks for having me, man. <laughs> Thanks, Lydia. <laughs>